I'm not going to use the microphone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. My voice carries really well. I was back in that old race, back in that old age where you hollered up the hogs, and so I, my <laughs> voice carries. Um, this is a very uh, interesting subject, particularly for people in the field of science. It's not a new subject. Uh, mRNA use as a means of getting genetic code into a species has been used for 30 some years. And I'm going to review just some basic biology with you and talk with you a little bit about what our concerns are. Why would we be concerned in veterinary medicine? Why would we be concerned in the livestock arena about mRNA? This is, uh, uh, it didn't go, let me try it again. Okay, I'll go with this, there we go. Um, Basic biology, you find this kind of uh, photograph, uh, this kind of graph in about any biology book. I taught biology a couple of three semesters to nursing students, uh, those ladies trying to become, uh, and men, I mean, actually becoming a registered nurse. And this is basic biology. As you know, DNA is contained in the nucleus of the cell, and it is coded for all the things that you need to develop. The real interesting thing about DNA is it basically has genetic code in it for proteins. And part of that protein family is enzymes. Now there's some codes in there to stop transcription at a certain point and start it up at a certain point. But basically the creator has organized your DNA to make proteins. And those proteins then are what, those, as you know, an enzyme is a protein that potentiates a chemical reaction. And so from that, you develop all of what you are as a human being. Your DNA is unique, so unique that it can be utilized in criminal analysis to prove that you are the one that did the crime. Unique in all the world. And yet DNA, the composition of it, is common to all species. The DNA in the tabletop in this wood functions just exactly like the DNA in you and the DNA in your dog, and the DNA in a bacteria. A uh, common creator, common source of genetic code. The DNA is a helical structure, two strands twisted together, and it spreads apart, and messenger RNA comes in and gathers the code. Now I want you to look at something here in this genetic code. Messenger RNA or RNA has a nucleic acid that's unique to it called uracil. Uracil is classified as a uh, universal nucleotide. It can match up with an A, which is here, as you can see, and it can also match up with other, it can match up with a G. So why is that important? These reactions occur in milliseconds. We tend to kind of calm it down. We think that mRNA kind of slips in there, grabs the code, and then it's instantaneous. If you don't believe that, that a chemical reaction is instantaneous, then fire a shotgun shell. Or put a tablespoon of baking soda on the table and put four or five drops of vinegar in it. Instantaneous. And that's one reason why viruses make mistakes. Everything is happening fast. The mRNA is called messenger RNA. It's going to get the code out of the DNA and it's going to use you to match up like the C. It's going to grab that code and it's going to go out to the cytoplasm of the cell outside of the nucleus in the ribosome. And at the ribosome, there are two other kinds of RNA. There's ribosomal RNA, which is incorporated into that structure called the ribosome and there's transfer RNA. Remember I told you that DNA codes for proteins, and every three nucleotides, A, C, G, G, C, A, whatever combination, is the code for one amino acid. Now, I'm sure you took some, uh, most of you took some animal science, you know there are essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids, and amino acids make up a protein. They're linked together to make a protein. So, Transfer RNA reads what's on messenger RNA, brings the corresponding amino acid. The ribosome RNA moves that strip of RNA from left to right until it builds a protein. Now these proteins are huge. 
Uh, if you were to look at uh, this, let's just say an antibody, an antibody against black leg in your cat, that antibody will have a huge molecular weight. That protein will all be wound together. And the best way that I know how to define that, if you're a kid and you knock the cover off your baseball or your softball, in that you saw all those strings in there wound up tight, well, that's what a protein looks like. It's not a big long strand stretching out here forever and ever. It's all folded up, bound up into a tight little ball. And they can be huge, 200,000 molecular weight, uh, 180,000 molecular weight, just, just huge. But they're folded up and tightly bound. Now I remember if you do what impact we had about bovine spongiform encephalopathy here in the United States when the cow that came out of Canada in 2003 in the Washington State, a prion, which causes mad cow disease, is a misfolded protein. The protein in the process of being manufactured had misfolded. The unfortunate thing is that misfolded protein, once it's consumed by the animal, causes more misfold, misfolded proteins to be manufactured. We're not sure we even know how that happens, but a prion propagates a prion. With messenger RNA, the potential of getting some misfolded protein certainly exists. And there's some real concerns long term that maybe when we get all of these proteins folded up and made up because of what mis mRNA is coding for, that eventually we may have one that's misfolded enough that it'd be classified as a prion. That is a identified risk. <coughs> So how does it work? I've explained it to you. I'm not going to explain it again. What is the truth? When Pfizer introduced their mRNA injection, they assured the public multiple times, all the media ran it, that the genetic code that was transcribed onto that mRNA would always stay in the cytoplasm. In other words, they gave the injection of the COVID injection and it contained the mRNA. The mRNA is absorbed by cells, and then that mRNA goes into the ribosome, and it starts making the spike protein, which is the little spikes that stick out of that virus, over and over and over again, and eventually your body says, oh, we better make an antibody to that spike protein, and supposedly you become immunized, and you immunized yourself. Do you understand how that means? You took the mRNA in an injection, it went in your cell, it made that cell then start making the spike protein in the virus, and eventually your body reacted to that, made its antibodies, and so you became your own source of antigen. You became the source of spike protein rather than the virus. Now how we would normally do, and how we do when vaccinate calves and dogs against coronavirus, we take the whole virus, we inactivate it, or we pass it down cell lines. We could put it in a cell line here and let it reproduce. And if we gave it to the dog, it would still cause disease. But we take it to the next cell line, and the next cell line. And maybe we pass it down 500 or 1,000 cell lines. And each time that virus goes through a replication generation, it becomes less of an infected virus. So that's how you make rabies vaccines, how you make the stemper vaccines, how you make uh, IBR vaccine. They can be modified live meaning that they are technically alive, but you've taken them down so many cell lines now that they're not capable of causing disease. So when you inject that, you inject the whole virus. Do you understand? You get antibodies against the spike protein. You get antibodies against other proteins. You get antibodies against the whole virus. But in this case, with mRNA, you're just going to develop antibodies against one specific spike protein. And remember I told you that this takes place instantaneously and that there is opportunity for mistakes? Well, the virus changed, didn't it? We had this strain for a while, and six months later we had this strain for a while, and every time you get a new strain, you get a new spike protein, and now what you took before doesn't work anymore. Um, they're still advertising in our community through the public health department. They want us to come in and take the vaccines at least every 90 days for the rest of our life. Because the immunity produced that way is short-lived. If you put the whole virus in there, now you've got long-lived immunity. A year or two. 
And so it required more and more and more. And mistakes are made when this virus is replicating. Now you have this strain, that strain, this strain, and that strain. And your messenger RNA is a very specific code, you understand? It's coding just for exactly what that particular protein is. And if that protein changes, and it can call, that virus can come in and cause disease, and you have antibodies to the other, the other one now, and they don't do you a dang bit of good. That's what happens. So, they do not affect or interact with our DNA. That's what they told us. Told us over and over, and this is right off the CDC website. I took that statement right off their website. Well, I'm gonna tell you that that is not the case. Here's what you get at the universities. This is uh, from an Ag Web, Ag Web article, relatively recent. Paige Carlson is the author. She interviews Dr. Kevin Folta from University of Florida. Um, and these are how he responds to anybody that might have any questions about mRNA. Anybody that might have any questions about <coughs> what, what is this potentially going to do. Now notice these questions. In, notice he's a smart man now. He knows that there's scientific data out there that this proves this entirely wrong. Notice what he says. mRNA never leaves the cells in which it's injected. You don't inject it into a cell. You inject it into an area that's absorbed into a cell. RNA is very unstable. He knows that's wrong because now we've changed RNA, which I'll tell you, to make it stable, to make it last for months and months and months. Normally, an RNA goes in, does its job, maybe it repeats it two, three, four times, and it's gone. It gets broken down. It doesn't last but a few days, maybe, at the most. Most of the time, it just lasts a few hours. We have modified mRNA now where it lasts for months and months and months. I'll show you that data. He knows that's not true. That's the statement he's making. This stands to be a revolutionary technology if we don't get in the way. So what you end up with here is you end up with a whole scientific community that is probably going to benefit from mRNA financially. He's going to get research money. University's going to get grants. I'll show you one that's already got a grant. They're all interested in this technology, and I, it is a fascinating technology. But if we are going to have affordable food, we need to have continued innovation in the animal, medical, veterinary space, and mRNA vaccines, and they're not vaccines, are safe and effective ways to treat the animal that does not change. Listen, what the media is doing and what people in the scientific community are doing is they are gaslighting anybody who says that mRNA might be questionable. Maybe we ought to see some data Maybe we ought to see a little bit of research to back up what you're talking about. How about going down the line and doing a trial of mRNA like you do with any viral vaccines that, that you want to bring on the market? It's a two, three, five, ten year process because they test them and they test them and they test them and they test them and then report the data. There is no data mRNA. You are just supposed to accept it as it is. Get out of the way and let science do its job. Get out of the way, and don't dare criticize it. Do you know what gaslighting means? It comes from a movie, an old movie, 1934, called Gaslight, where a guy tried to convince his wife through a psychological manipulation that she was mentally ill and needed to be put in an asylum so he could have another woman. That's what gaslight, it's, it's an effort and attempt to make you think you are wrong, to make you question any question you might have had, and also try to position you as incompetent, um, not capable, and no one should listen to you. That's what gaslighting is. That's what you get if you question this technology. Here's the truth. Swedish researchers, now he knows that data is out there. You notice the statement that Dr. Folta made? Never leaves the cytoplasm, right? He knows this research is out there, they put the COVID injection mRNA in a group of liver cancer cells. And notice what it says, in six hours, the, the genetic code that the mRNA carried was in the DNA of those cells. Six hours? Six hours. 
called reverse transcription, meaning the mRNA that they that you got in your injections for COVID, that mRNA went into the nucleus and added the code that was on the mRNA to that cell's DNA. That's what mRNA was originally designed to do, to help someone produce something they couldn't produce otherwise. Diabetic can't make insulin because islands of pancreas are not functioning or are gone. You give mRNA that codes for insulin, which is a very small, simple protein, and you get a muscle cell to make the insulin for you. Not true. So are they vaccines? I have to correct myself because they changed the definition of a vaccine. I described to you what a vaccine really is. You take a virus, you grow it in a cell culture, you grow it enough times that it loses enough strength that can't cause disease but can still stimulate an immune re reaction, or you grow it, collect it, kill it, usually with heat, and inject the dead virus in. Now, when you inject a dead virus, it takes a lot more viral particles to stimulate the kind of immunity you get from a modified live virus, one that's gone down these cell lines, because that modified live virus will replicate in the body and make more of itself. So instead of giving, you know, 500,000 viral particles, this modified live uh, virus may give you 50 million viral particles. A lot stronger immune response, a lot more extended immune response. But you have passed it down the line. That takes years to develop those vaccines. They have to be tested to make sure there's not reactions, that it won't cause disease. You don't just generate a vaccine overnight. It takes years. Um, mRNA, there was no testing. There was nothing. You just got it. It was just available. Bang. Now we're getting the data and it's not very pretty. So is it a vaccine? No, it's not. It's a gene therapy, technically. I've described to you how it works. If you were missing a specific hormone, we just developed an mRNA vaccine for cats um, to sterilize them. It's an mRNA that will produce um, the Morovian protein that's involved in ovulation and immunizes the cat against that. So the cat still, how'd you like to have a cat that just comes in heat all the time and never has, you know what a cat does when they come in heat? Meow, meow, over and over and over. Well, anyway, they played her. Listen, that's gene therapy. You understand what I'm talking about? You put the genes in there, they get absorbed into the nucleus. Now that animal is producing antibodies against that particular protein. And now it can't ovulate, but it's always in heat. I don't know what they hope to gain by that, but that's where we're going. So it is gene therapy, and that's what it was designed for. It was designed to get genetic code into people that were missing a specific uh, particular thing in their body. Insulin's probably the easiest one for you to remember and know about. FDA still defines uh, mRNA is gene therapy. Never have changed it. Anything that's submitted to the FDA, it's, it's submitted under the arena of gene therapy, not vaccine. I would advise all of you to get rid of the term vaccine. I don't know if you saw what they what their what their definition is now. Their definition now is anything that stimulates the immune response. Well, what about vitamin D, Dr. Haynes? What about vitamin E? What about selenium? What about iron? Now, are they all vaccines? It, it, and they changed it immediately when the government wanted to push this uh, COVID vaccine. Um, Roger Meacock, MRCVS, stands for a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Science. Surgeons, surgeons. That's the same as a DVM in the United States. He is working in the United Kingdom to put together a letter to concern, of concern to go to the World Health Organization. And he and I met by Zoom this week and I've signed on to that letter and RCAF has approved it. Um, important point to make here, you got one portion of the government, the CDC, calling the uh, COVID injection, the mRNA injections, a vaccine. You got one segment of the same federal government. Now, this gentleman defined us uh, about the federal government and how they operate. A lot of you didn't know the USDA had an enforcement agency, did you? Um, and they're calling it what it is, which is gene therapy. 
you're going to clear any product to the FDA, that's what it's going to be cleared as. And I think that's significant. I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but did you know that Pfizer did not develop the COVID vaccine? See, I said it myself. Over and over. It, they've got you in the subconscious. They did not develop it. It's a German product by BioNTech. There is uh, the label off of the COVID injection that everyone got in the United States from Pfizer. It's also the same with Moderna. Uh, the one that has been kind of semi-developed COVID is the one by Johnson & Johnson, but it's not an mRNA product. So I want you to notice a couple of things about we think we're going to jump on the bandwagon here in veterinary medicine with mRNA injections, right? Notice a couple of things here. You notice that prior to the Lucian store app, you know what those temperatures are? Anybody do any artificial insemination? That's liquid nitrogen temperatures. And then you dilute it out with, uh, take it out, dilute it out with saline, and you inject 0.3 ml. Anybody here got a 0.3 ml syringe? <coughs> Now, they won't be 0.3 ml when they come out with it, it'll be 2 ml or 1 ml. But what I'm pointing out here is it takes a teeny tiny amount of mRNA per injection. Teeny tiny amount. It has to be kept cold at liquid nitrogen temperatures and it has to be used within <coughs> six hours of thawing it out. It is not light stable. You're not going to be able to have it out in the tailgate your pickup truck at the Brandon chute. Um, you're going to have to have some way to cover it up if, you're, if you are going to use it. So there are a lot of complications with it. A lot of pharmacies and uh, medical facilities got in big trouble because they didn't want to throw this away. You know, this stuff's about 40 or 50 bucks an injection. And they didn't want to throw it away, so after six hours, they just kept on using it. There were a lot of people who got an injection that didn't have any impact on them at all. They should probably <coughs> be good Lord for that. But just to point out, this is not a U.S. technology. This is a German technology. Um, we did not develop it. <coughs> Let's talk a minute about lipid nanoparticles. In order to get the mRNA into the body, it has to be encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle. You say, well, good Lord, Doc, what the heck's a... A lipid nanoparticle, it's a little glob of fat. All right? It's a little gob of butter, a little gob of fat that they hide the mRNA in, try to protect it a little bit, and then they inject that into you. So you're not just getting an injection of mRNA, it comes in the form of these lipid nanoparticles. And Dr. Meekak has done Meekock has done a lot of work with this. These things are very inflammatory. Uh, they stimulate inflammatory pathways, and he is of the firm uh, belief, and he's quite qualified to make this statement, that these lipid nanoparticles cause blood vessel blockage. Now, one of the things we noticed with a lot of reactions with COVID injections was blood clots in people. They would get the injection, maybe the booster, within a week or 10 days they're dead. And uh, the uh, morticians would open them up and their blood vessels would be full of blood clots white blood clots actually. Lots of complications. I just read an article from Dr. McCulloch today. Um, in the data that they have so far, very reliable sources from several countries, 15% um, of everybody that took the mRNA injection for COVID in, in the world overall, it comes from Sweden and Israel, Africa and Australia, 15% suffered some type of adverse reaction. <coughs> uh, are we going to see them in veterinary medicine? Well, you better believe we're going to see them. Uh, the commitment has already been made. Bayer Animal Health actually gave their facility over to BioNTech to help them make more vaccine. We made human vaccine in the veterinary facility because they're identical. Uh, Merck is the one right now that has a provisionally licensed mRNA product line for swine. And here's the one I was telling you about. Iowa State has received a grant to develop an mRNA injection for syncytial virus, um, bovine respiratory syncytial virus. You see a lot of that out in Nebraska. You see it up in South, southern South Dakota. It's a virus that causes fluid accumulating in the lungs of calves and it's not treatable um, 
discovered it back in the late 1970s. And so they're working on, they started this project, they hope to have it done sometime this year. Uh, are there any licensed mRNA injections in the U.S.? No, there are none. No, the FDA, USDA has not licensed any mRNA injection in the United States. There are development for lumpy skin disease, for hoof and mouth, foot and mouth, as we call it, a variety of other viruses in other parts of the world. Again, all driven by these German companies. These are all, this BioNTech is the one that, that is cooperating with all these other government entities around the world to make these mRNA injections. So it's coming down the line. We have a provisionally licensed, anyone know what an autogenous bacterium is? That Latin means autogenesis, which means it's generated from the bacteria that comes off of your farm. We've been doing that for decades and decades where we would go in and find the pink eye bug causing problems on your farm. And we'd find the salmonella causing problems on your swine facility. We'd take that to a lab, we'd grow it, we develop it, we kill it, we'd inject it into a bunch of hamsters to see if they survived it. Guinea pigs, the best source of testing animal for cattle. And if we didn't kill a lot of them, then we would go out and vaccinate our cattle for that. The FDA allowed us to do that for one year. And then if we were going to uh, do it again, we had to get another license, we had to get another set of bacteria. Well, it works the same way with these viruses. If you have circovirus and some swine, if you had swine influenza A, if you had uh, some other kind of virus, they did it when this EPD came on. EPD, um, porcine in, in an epidemic viral diarrhea, so I didn't say that's EPD. Anyway, TGE-like thing that hit this country here all two, three years ago, wiped out all these baby pigs and all these confinements, came over on rice holes that were in vitamin A and E and so on from China. Another uh, problem with having all your medications and all your nutrients made in another country. But anyway, they used it then first. They went in and got the virus. They grew it in a certain class of bacteria. Bacteria made the mRNA that had the code for a portion of the virus. They pulled that out. They isolated it and they injected it into swine to stop the spread of this disease. They're doing it now with several different viruses. You can look it up on the internet. Merck is a big proponent of that. They have a lab called Harris Vaccines that they are they're working on it, doing it on a regular basis. Why would a pharmaceutical firm like Merck or Bayer, or why would Iowa State getting a grant, why is anyone interested in this? Well, do you see how long it takes to do it? You see that? Eight to 12 weeks. You can make up this mRNA product ready to inject in eight to 12 weeks compared to years it takes to develop a normal vaccine through the normal route that we know. It, it's very low dose. I showed you that they're giving 0.3 mLs to human patients. Do you know what 0.3 mLs is? Well, let me give it to you. Take an eyedropper and drop three drops out of it. That's 0.3 mLs. A tenth of a milliliter, a tenth of a cc is one drop. Very low dose. Uh, much more profitable, though long-term te testing required. And I can tell you that you can go anywhere you want on the internet to try to find a, level, a label for this sequivity is what they're calling it. And you cannot find a label you cannot find any safety data. You can find nothing on it because up here, it's a specific facility, specific pathogen, specific outbreak, and it comes under veterinary prescription only. It's private. They have no idea how many pigs die when they give it. Don't have any idea where it's given. Don't have any idea about anything. Can't find any data. Don't, don't have a label. Don't know anything because it's all done privately. Could you be eating pork that has been injected with mRNA? Absolutely. What's pseudouridine? I talked to you about uracil being kind of a universal nucleic acid for mRNA. It makes it go fast. Well, they've learned how to replace uracil with a compound called pseudouracil. Well, pseudouracil maintains the biological activity of mRNA from a few hours to a few days to months. 
and that's why they have utilized it, which is a problem, and I'll, I'll show you here in just a second why it's a problem. Natural mRNA is short-lived. mRNA manufactures pseudouridine, long-living. It just keeps coding for it over and over and over and over and over and over. It won't go away. It won't quit. And that's why a lot of the people that got the COVID injection, this mRNA stayed around and just kept making more spike protein and more spike protein and more spike protein. And spike protein in itself is toxic, Dr. Hanks. Significantly toxic. <clears throat> so here's data. They know the data's out there. These are peer-reviewed scientific articles. I just put three or four of them up here for you. This uh, Brogen et al. has found mRNA in lymph nodes 60 days after it was injected. We've got other data that's come out here recently that I don't have slides finding it six months after. So, so what? So it just keeps doing that. Well, one of the issues that we have found is that with these lipid nanoparticles, this product doesn't stay, like Dr. Fulta said there, right where it's injected. It goes all through the body. And these lipid nanoparticles, then the mRNA that is in them gets excreted from the body in various manners, called extracellular vesicles. In essence, what that means is the body's trying to get rid of this stuff. It comes out in the sweat, it comes out in the spit, it comes out in the tears. Um, that means that a vaccinated person can literally give the mRNA to the spike protein to someone like myself that never took the product by just simply being in close association with them like you would if you spread the cold or spread the flu. And that's one reason why people are very concerned about this mRNA technology. I, for one, would not like to have the genetic code for foot and mouth disease in me if I could keep from it. Would you, Dr. Hank? I, for one, would not like to have the code for <coughs> lumpy skin disease or whole cholera in me if I keep from it. That's just, that's just me, I guess. <laughs> but that's what's going to happen. Yeah, that's right. And that's what does happen. Yes, sir. What about urine? Is it passed? Passed? Urine is not listed on here, but I can't imagine why. We know it passes the placenta. We know that it goes through breast milk. So, so that means uh, all of our waste disposal could happen. Yeah, I'm not sure it could stand all of that that's going on with that. Um, you know, even though it's got pseudouridine, it eventually breaks down. It's not going to be around forever and ever and ever. So what can we do? Little old us out here in the world, little old Doc Thornsbury in Richland, Missouri. Well, one thing we can do is become educated about mRNA. Most people don't know about mRNA because they try to keep it a secret. You get on Google and just try to search some various things. Search for uh, uh, bad reactions to COVID injection. You can't find them. You're going to have to go to a whole lot of specialized effort to even come up with data that would really be real. Um, it's a process of keeping all of this under the carpet, so to speak. Trying to keep it quiet. Not let the, can you think the average person really wants to know what mRNA is? They don't want to know, do they? The average 16 year old girl is not interested. Just give me the shot, right? The doctor says it's okay, give me the shot. I need a booster in 60 days, okay. I need a booster in another, oh, okay. And then finally they wane off. Very, very few people got more than three injections. They finally said that's enough. But it takes repeated all the time because Everything changes. Make sure our legislators know our concern. We had a bill here in uh, Missouri that I worked with and others, I didn't know about it early enough to really put my effort in, that all the bill said is if you're going to market poultry, you're going to market swine and pork in the state of Missouri that's had mRNA injections, label it. So that the consumer knows what has been injected with mRNA and what is not. As you know, the FDA just this week uh, formally approved it's either five or six new genetically modified strains of pork. 
Does your generation like genetically modified? My daughter doesn't like it at all. She'll do everything she can to stay away from it. Now, I don't know that all genetically modified things are bad. We use Roundup, don't we? That's genetically modified. Um, but what are they modified for? What virus are they designed not to get? I don't know. Can't find the data. It's secret. You can dig layers and layers and layers deep in Google and never come up with it. Here's some advice. Subscribe to Dr. Malone and Dr. McCullough's daily updates. It does not cost you a thing to get just like the headline and the two or three paragraphs. Five dollars a month to subscribe to their very in-depth evaluation. They put all kinds of peer-reviewed papers up. You will learn more from the headlines than the average person will ever know about mRNA. Just simply a free subscription. Just give them your email. He'll send you something every day. Both of them will. You know, it's interesting that those that are speaking say, let's slow down here a little bit about mRNA or my age or older. I don't know of one young physician that I have seen, including my own son, that said, let's slow down. Do you know physicians in the United States were paid to give you the COVID injection? They were paid a significant amount of money. The more people they got to take the injection, the more they got paid. There's clear evidence of it, clear evidence. It could be up to $250 a patient. I wondered why my physician kept trying to talk me into taking it, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Now I know. Yes, sir. Back in 1993, BSD came out. The marriage was paid to promote it. Same stuff. Somebody told me, follow the money. And unfortunately, I think they're probably true. Another person told me it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that one's 100% true. Yeah. Do not accept the mainline media's unequivocal support for mRNA. I don't know if you're finding out here just this week how Facebook and other media sources have acquiesced to the government. The government pays them to put out stories. The government pays them to take conflicting information down. Um, do not believe the media. Demand mandatory cool to identify animals that have received mRNA. Now, I'm not telling you that I'm totally down on these new technologies. I'm not. But I'm not enamored with them just because they are new. Show me the data. That's what we say, isn't it, Dr. Right. Ames, in the medical field? Show me the data. If it's so good, let me see the papers. Let me see some peer-reviewed data that's been evaluated by people that are statisticians and can tell me what the probabilities are that this is correct. Can it be repeated? What's the probabilities? More, more information is coming, and I can tell you most of it is not real good. If you're going to speak with any kind of reservation about just blanket acceptance of mRNA, you can expect to be gaslighted, and there's no space in there, unfortunately, it's one word, and labeled a source of misinformation. Uh, we put out some basic information, a letter, I put out a paper. Um, Bill published it. Drover's Journal got um, scientists down at Texas A&M, College of Veterinary Medicine, to write a scathing rebuke of what we had written. All our, all our concern was to show us the data. Scathing rebuke, gaslighting us, telling us we were fear mongers and a source of misinformation. And so I developed a scientific response to it, sent it to them, and the editor of the Drover's Journal website said, I'm not going to publish it. It'll just confuse my readers. It'll just confuse my readers. The truth shall set you free is what I remember. So it's our responsibility. You know Festus. Everybody watch uh, Gunsmoke. Watch Ken Curtis plays Festus. 
He always he has this common saying about oh every third or fourth show he tries to get Doc to do something or he tries to get Matt. Well, I'm just going to do it my own self. <laughs> this is what you've got to do your own self. You're not going to find the information out there floating around. Now, Dr. Meacox, Mr. Meacox, MRS, they don't call themselves doctor. A veterinary surgeon, Roger Meacock, has a letter of concern that we have signed on to. You can find it on the RCAP website on the Animal Health Committee section. I have a paper that I've written that contains a lot of this information and quite a bit more that says we seek the truth. You can email me. My email address is up underneath my um, bio. You email me and I'll shoot you a Word file of that particular paper. You can do whatever you want to with it. My suggestion is have your friends read it, send it to your sale barn, not that we're down on new technology, all right? I'm not down on new technology. You know, it took Liz Stewart and past Stewart years to convince physicians that bacteria were a source of disease. They laughed them to scorn. The obvious sometimes gets laughed to scorn, but it's never wrong to question. It's never wrong to seek the truth. It's never wrong to bring attention to things that are negative about something that is just like got an aura of invincibility and around it. I mean, you you put out anything out there that's different than what the mainline media want, you're labeled a source of misinformation. You'll be, what's it called that, Brendan, when Snopes look at something? You'll be fact-checked. Check. You'll be fact-checked and found to be wrong. <laughs> Stay educated. Keep on top of it. It's coming. We're going to have it. It's going to be in veterinary medicine, and I've shown you why. It's cheap, it's quick, it's simple. Um, it's not really that simple, but it's simple for them. And it doesn't require a bunch of testing. It doesn't require years of analysis. It doesn't require submitting data. At least I can't find any data other than a little bit of data that was done on the human product. If they're not going to have to submit data on the human product, what do you think about your cattle? you think that's going to require data? And maybe even worth our taxpayer dollars paid for all the coronavirus vaccines put out. Well, it wasn't free. It was not no, free. Was. Absolutely not. Very expensive three drops. Very expensive three drops. Any any questions that you might have? I would highly recommend you go to the RCAF website and look up that letter of concern. Uh, it's a pretty deep, pretty scientific, but he's got it all spelled out. A veterinary surgeon Meacock and it, and it is an excellent piece. I've just signed on as supportive of what he has put together. A reference list, three or four pages long, scientific data to back it up. Thank y'all.